This film is about Western Port. Western Port is an area situated to the southeast of Melbourne, along the southern coast of Victoria. This is an area of almost unique diversity. 70% of all the plant and animal life that is native to Victoria is found in Western Port. It also supports valuable shipping, valuable farming, an enormous amount of recreational activities, including fishing and all sorts of other water things. And it's the most popular area in the state. The main tourist road in Victoria runs right down the side of Western Port to the Penguins at Phillip Island. If you've ever been to the Penguins, you've been to Western Port. It's a fabulous natural wonderland, and like a lot of other fabulous natural wonderlands in the world, it is now in a bit of trouble. What we used to have in the clear water were millions of fish, sea dragons, corals and sponge gardens. Now we've got a problem. The water has become turbid, the seagrass has died off and the mangroves have died off. The causes of these things are runoff from the farms through the creeks, sediment carried from the catchment into Western Port Bay, sediment smothers the seagrass, the sediment starves the seabed of light and the plants can't photosynthesize. The cure is to slow the flow of the streams, to plant seagrasses and to plant mangroves. But let's go back to the beginning. The bay was formed when 10,000 years ago water rushed in from Bass Strait to fill what was called a sunk land. About a third of the bay is uh, made up of intertidal mudflats, which simply means that when the tide is out, about a third of the bay is mud. It therefore is a wonderful habitat for birds, principally uh, water birds, many of which are migratory. We're going to be going under the water and we're going to be looking at these beautiful plants and animals that live in the marine world of Western Port. We're also going to look at the land around the bay. The land is the catchment in which the rain falls which runs into the bay. There have always been changes in Western Port. In 1975 a major study was done into the status of the bay. At that time uh, it was one of the largest pristine bodies of water anywhere in the world near a major metropolitan centre. The study was called the Shapiro Report and it warned of the dangers that were likely to be encountered in the next few years. A lot of those dangers were not heard properly and a lot of those problems now exist. Furthermore there is an enormous suburban growth corridor right down across the top of Western Port which puts enormous pressure on what is very low-lying land. There are some significant human-made problems in Western Port and we're going to have to address them. There are things we can do. We're going to hear about all those. So put the kettle on. Here we go. It's, it's rich with seagrass beds and sea dragons and sheltered bays with amazing lamp shells and all sorts of creatures are living in this great bay. There's just an amazing variety of plants and animals and birds and fish and, and, and landscapes and types of soil. So. Uh, we're very fortunate to have that, and it's a very unique and wonderful part of Victoria. But it's also a bay that has a lot of human influence on it, so we do make an impact with the runoff that comes out of the rivers and the creeks and the boating activities and the different things we do in Western Port have an impact. It's been fundamentally sort of changed in the early 1900s and then again the middle 1900s, it's like a big green sponge. It had all these rivers draining all their water, but it was all slowed down in this massive tea tree and other plant life uh, before it got to the bay. Well, we chose to remove all that. Clearing the Coorup up swamp must definitely have had a big effect, depositing all this silt on it. We've not only lost that freshwater swamp, possibly the largest in the southern hemisphere, we've fundamentally changed that ecosystem because we know those clay banks, that clay shoreline, 
is eroding dramatically. Is it? Yeah, that, that contributes about 30% of the fine sediment into that whole northern area of Western Port. I've measured a, a metre a year being eroded away, and that's all good salt marsh habitat that orange-bellied par parrot could use. Sea levels have been rising throughout the 20th century. They rose at about a rate of one to two millimetres per year. Just in the last 15 or so years, the rate has increased to about three millimetres per year globally. The black swans are, um, are herbivores, so they, they eat plant material and they eat seagrass, which is a very important part of the functioning of, of the ecosystem of Western Port. And we've, we certainly have, we know we've got a lot less seagrass in Western Port. I've been working with Landcare in, in this region for 10 years. And well, I know from a child, I, I remember when the water quality changed in Western Port. I remember looking in the water and thinking, what's, what's going on? Why is the, the water so murky and muddy? And um, here I am 20, 30 years later trying to do something about it. If you look at a map of uh, Australia in 1800, you'll see the big gap where Victoria is. Nobody knew what was here until basically George Bass was sent from Sydney to see if there was a port to the west of Sydney and he came right round here and discovered there was one, which is why this is called Western Port, even though it's slightly to the east of Port Phillip Bay, which had of course yet to be discovered at that time. There were people living here, there were Aboriginal communities right around here of the Bunurong people and they lived off shellfish and from birds and from plant life and there are middens all over Western Port. Well, if you talk about Western Port, you have to think about the catchment, the land on which the rain falls and the water drains into Western Port. And that catchment is some 350,000 hectares in area. In geological terms, uh, it's a sunk land. The, some many thousands of years ago, that part of Victoria sank under geological and earthquake activity. And then the sea level rose and all that area got flooded with water and it goes all the way up to the forested hills in the Bunyip State Park, mm. right, and it, it encompasses, of course, very significantly, a very large central area of that catchment was, at one time, the Kuirup Swamp. It was a barrier to people moving from the northern part of the state, particularly Melbourne and, and the Monita Peninsula, around to South Gippsland. Being, you know, saturated soils, they, they were very rich in nutrients and um, sediments from, you know, hundreds of thousands of years probably of deposits of soil from the upper catchment, mm. coupled with water being a very rich environment to, um, to farm was, was the attitude and that they, all they had to do was get a, get a bit of the water away, so they drained it. And it was drained about by the end of the 19th century and it has now resulted in the Kuiwap land now being some of the most productive and wealthiest agricultural land in Victoria. But we've also got, as a consequence, a very significant input of sediment and soil coming into the bay. Yes. Some 70% of that soil particles which come in with the seepage of water from the main drain comes from agricultural land. The other 30%, interestingly enough, comes from soil erosion around the cliffs, particularly in the northeast part of the bay. This is around the top of French Island. In this area, the tide never quite flushes properly because it meets itself coming the other way. The tide wraps itself around French Island and as a result, any sediment in the water never quite settles. The study showed that suspended sediment uh, is in the order of about 60,000 tonnes a year from the five major feeder streams. This has probably been consistent over the last century. So 60,000 tonnes of sediment that go into that northern and eastern western port zone that probably didn't reach there before when the swamp was in existence. I think that the draining of the Kuirup swamp, you know, back sort of halfway through the last century, that the environment's response to that has been 
incredibly slow. Now, anecdotal evidence, I was speaking to um, an Indigenous spokesperson at the end of last year, and he said, ah, Auntie Ida told me that back in 1967 she used to collect little mollusks from on the seagrass, so you could walk on the seagrass mm. in the 60s. But she'd noticed then that the little mollusks had lost their luster. Yeah. Now, that's a nutrient response. But that's what you would anticipate, that we actually disrupted the nutrient cycling by changing the way the fresh water got to the bay. Talking to the earliest divers in Western Port Bay, they say 35 years ago the visibility was much better. Um, if you go back even 100 years before that, they were draining the Cooey Rup Swamp, which was a huge salt marsh area that used to trap all the, the grit and sand that get got run off in rivers and floods and whenever there were storms, it acted as a trap to stop too much sediment coming in. Now, that was drained, it's been turned into farms with big kind of channels down the middle of them. So if you get storms or earth clearing or there's no vegetation, all this sediment rushes down and gets dumped over the top of the seagrass meadows, the sponge gardens, all the creatures that live in Western Port. And so if you look over a 100 or 150 year time span, there's been enormous changes in the pressures on that system and the amount of silt that's in that water. And most of the time, for most of Western Port, it looks like coffee. And that coffee is all the fine silt sediment that is coming as just rain. It's being rained down on all the animals mm. coming in with all the water flow. Satellite photographs show that the northeast of the bay, there's sediment everywhere there. It's washing off the, the Lang Lang cliffs. And that, and that just deposits on the seagrass. So I've tried to grow seagrass up there and it just gets smothered by a slimy brown material and, and it just won't grow. All this material here is silt from the erosion of these cliffs. The cliffs are made of very crumbly and friable material and there's nothing whatever to protect them. So when the tide comes in, the water comes right up over these cliffs and up into this salt marsh. In 10 years, none of this will be here. Those cliffs are eroding quite rapidly at the moment, about one metre per year, mm. going back. And the fact that the water is now much muddier than it used to be is almost certainly the cause of the loss of all the seagrass in Western Port. The same thing has happened in West Australia, in South Australia and in Queensland. Everyone has now concluded that the main causative factor in causing loss of seagrass was the increased turbidity from soil erosion. And turbidity <coughs> is, the, is the lack of clarity in the sea? Yeah, that's right. All plants require sunlight. They use the sunlight energy to turn carbon dioxide into sugars and plant material. If the water is turbid, that cuts back the amount of sunlight reaching the bottom where the seagrasses are growing. That means that they are starved of sunlight and they never get going. So that's uh, the reason why the sediment is not a good thing. And that sediment, unfortunately, just doesn't settle to the bottom and stay there. The, the constant gentle movement of water around the top of French Island in a clockwise direction is moving.